Good morning and welcome to Ebenezer. My name is Chris Beckman and I'm the corporate chaplain for Ebenezer. And if you're watching uh, this worship service today, you're probably part of our Ebenezer family. We go all the way from Grand Marais in the north to Des Moines, Iowa in the south, and our newest buildings are is starting in Wisconsin. And you may even be watching from Sarasota or Naples, Florida, our two newest members of our Ebenezer family. Please join us as we sing together our opening hymn, Trust and Obey. Please join us as we sing together, Trust and Obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with Our worship continues with the dialogue, and I invite you, the congregation, to respond with the bold portion. May peace on earth fill the world. Let the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. Let us journey with the Magi in wonder and awe. May we see in all things the wonderful works of God. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be His kingdom now and forever. Let us continue to follow the star. May the babe of Bethlehem be our strength and guide. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. Let us pray. O God, in this time after the Epiphany, we remember the Magi who began their long journey home, having seen and experienced your incarnation. Kindle in us the same fire of your love and strengthen our lives for service to your kingdom. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our gospel for this fifth week of Epiphany is from the book of Matthew, the fifth chapter. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely 
on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Here ends our gospel reading. Will you join with me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be ever acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and Redeemer. Amen. No doubt uh, this passage is familiar to you. It's called the Beatitudes, the Blessings. And it begins the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. It's a good reminder that this sermon is actually in two places in the Gospels, Matthew and Luke. In Matthew, the sermon happens on a mountain. And so it's called the Sermon on the Mount. In Luke, however, the sermon takes place on the plain, and so it's called the Sermon on the Plain. But the Beatitudes, the blessings, are really the preamble, the beginning to the entire Sermon on the Mount. Those of you who know your Constitution, the preamble to the Constitution, this would be the part where it's, we the people, that kind of poetic and flourish of words and thoughts and images at the very begin, beginning of such a heartfelt and important document. The same is true for this Sermon on the Mount. The Beatitudes are sort of this culmination, this invitation, this poetic collection of thoughts that begins the grittier parts of the Sermon on the Mount. The people were ready for a sermon from Jesus. They were ready for something major. And perhaps that's why so many people gathered to hear the Sermon on the Mount and to gather around Jesus and begin to follow him. You see, Jesus had been teaching in their synagogues. He had been going from town to town, offering up these wonderful interpretations of Scripture. And along with that, he had been making these kind of radical proclamations. Things about the Roman Empire that was ruling over Israel and was grinding the people into a powder. And not only that, but Jesus was making these strong proclamations about the religious leaders within Judaism the priests and the high priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And as a clergy person myself, I can even feel that myself when Jesus is making these proclamations about the religious leadership. And I, as a religious leader, I feel myself cringing because in some ways I'm closer to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But the folk, the people who were hearing their priests criticized, who were hearing their Roman overlords criticized, they were getting excited because something was likely to happen. But maybe most importantly, maybe the reason that they gathered was not so much to hear Jesus talk, but because Jesus everywhere he went was healing people and curing them. In fact, the text tells us that Jesus was healing every disease and curing every disease possible. Think about that, my friends. Those of us on our long journeys, most of us who are listening to this, have a whole litany of things that we would love to have healed or cured. Do you think if Jesus were in the neighborhood and you or I with our gout or our or our arthritis, or our hip failure, or our knee concerns, or even our memory loss, if we knew that Jesus was present or near here, I can guarantee you, you and I would pull out every stop possible to get there. It's also because not only is Jesus someone who preaches about this, but he actually lives it out and provides and provides what people are desiring, healing and compassion. 
It occurred to me, uh, since I am mostly an administrative chaplain at this point, that I don't get out to the sites as much as I would like, that Jesus, in a way, is saying, I might be the savior of the world, but I'm a working minister. <laughs> I put on my overalls and my work gloves, and I'm out there doing the job of a minister. I love that, a working preacher. In fact, there's a website at Luther Seminary that I often get some of my information for preaching on that's called Working Preacher. And it's this sense that not only is Jesus going to be this delegator who will send the disciples out, but he does the work himself. And that lends a great deal of authenticity and real presence to have Jesus who could have said, you know, Peter, you go out and do this. Andrew, you go do that. James and John, you do this. I'm going to sit here in my office and I'm going to delegate. <laughs> it's a good reminder to me. And it's kind of one of those things where I think, ah, I don't want to be in my office that much. And if I really want to be doing the ministry, then all I need to do is follow the example of Jesus, who was a working preacher himself, a working pastor, who was healing and curing and trying to make sure the people had enough to eat. I think about that, Jesus being a working preacher, a working minister, not just an administrator or a delegator, but someone who enacted the ministry in person with the people who were around him. Actually, one of my colleagues helped to frame this Beatitudes in a slightly different way. You see, usually I have uh, struggled because I have heard this passage and these Beatitudes countless times. And in fact, it is so easy for me to hear that, of course, those who are sick are blessed. Of course, those who are poor are blessed. Of course, those who wrestle for peace are blessed. But one of my colleagues kind of turned it on its head a little bit, which is always helpful for me, because I do this work so much that it's hard for me to see it in a new way. Instead of thinking of the people who are being blessed and that this passage is about them, maybe it is a call to active ministry. Maybe in a way Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount to himself. And he's saying that these beatitudes, these blessings, are really Jesus' job. <laughs> Jesus might be saying to himself and to his disciples, this is your laundry list of your work that you are going to do. You are going to bless the poor. You are going to bless those who are without. You're going to bless those who are meek, who are mourning. You're going to bless and be a peaceful presence wherever you go. Think about that, my friends. What if this list of blessings was not only about those of us who are poor and struggling, that we are blessed because of that? But what if we turn it on its head and imagine that our call as Christians is to be that blessing for others? What if as we look at this list of blessings, you and I were supposed to choose one? <laughs> what if there was a question, okay, which one of these blessings do you want to be in the world? Do you want to bless the poor? Do you want to bless the sick? Do you want to bless those who mourn? Do you want to be the peacemaker? Do you want to be someone who fights for justice? Isn't that an interesting turnaround? You see, Jesus is a working pastor. He's a working priest. He's a working minister. And the reason he works, I think, is because all of us who are Christians are invited into that work as well. 
Why do you think he called the disciples? Not only because Jesus wanted help in doing the work, but he, part of our Christian faith and journey is inviting us into those tasks that Jesus himself did. Interesting side note, when Jesus is preaching this sermon to the disciples, as we just heard from last week, there are only four disciples at this point. All we have are Peter and his brother Andrew and James and John. The rest of them haven't been called yet. Interesting side note. But Peter and Andrew and James and John and all of those who are gathered, perhaps not only did they hear that there's a place in God's kingdom if I'm poor, if I'm mourning, if I'm suffering, but what if also the message was, here's a list of the most important things we do as Christians. Caring for the sick, caring for the poor, caring for those who are grieving the loss of someone, taking care of those who have been manipulated by society, standing up for those who have had lacked justice. And maybe importantly, as we think about what's happening in Ukraine now, maybe you're called to be the peacemaker in a place far, far away. Think about that, my friends. What if I were to send you a card <laughs> that had all of this listed on it? Care for the poor. Care for the sick. Care for those who are grieving. Being a peacemaker. And had a checkbox by it. <laughs> and said, take this card and check the box that you most want to be part of. That that is your job as a person of faith. To say, what is it that you most want to be a blessing to in this world? For example, I'm a working minister. I like to think I am. If that card came to me and I had those 10 choices before me, you know which box I would check? Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who grieve. That's my gift. And in this world, the place where I am perhaps the most blessing to is when people are suffering and grieving the loss of a loved one. I have lost track of the number of funerals that I have done over my career. But the number of baptisms, the number of weddings, that's a much easier thing for me to count. You see, if you were to ask me what my gift is, I'm gifted at caring for people at the end of life. That's my gift. In fact, sometimes I get kind of a little quirky. You see, you probably have been to one of those silent auctions before. Have you ever been to one of those? And I always struggle to know what could I offer up as a silent auction gift. And lately, my wife the other day said to me, well, Chris, Pastor Chris, why don't you put up for auction uh, to the highest bidder that Chaplain Chris, Pastor Chris, will do a baptism, a wedding, or a funeral to the highest bidder. <laughs> now, I would never tell my bishop about that. They would be very uncomfortable with that. But think about it. And the point is not that I would put something like that up for a silent auction. But if you know anything about me, you wouldn't want me to do the baptism or the wedding as much as you would want me to do your funeral. I am the funeral guy. I am the one that I, I can't hardly think of anyone that does a better funeral than I do. And I don't say that out of arrogance. I say that because it is my gift. I do weddings, but I'm not great at them. And I often only do them for people that I really care about. And I do baptisms, but I'm not often around kids as much anymore. But I will do a funeral for just about anyone, any time, any place. Because when I hear the Sermon on the Mount, 
Blessed are those who mourn. I am convinced that that is my gift. The question might be, as we go along our journeys of life and faith, is what happens, Chris, when you get older and you can't maybe speak from a pulpit? What then? Well, maybe then I become the peacemaker. Maybe I become one who advocates for those who are getting manipulated to buy vital siding or lemon cars. The interesting task here, my friends, is to imagine this list of blessings as a charge to us. Which one are you most called to do? And has it changed over your life? Maybe when you were in your 20s, you were an advocate for social justice, righteousness. And maybe now as you're an adult or later in life, you're more called to care for the sick. Or maybe you have discovered that your gift at this charge of your life is I really want to care for the poor or the elderly or the sick. Which do you think you are, my friends? And has it changed over your life? Were you once an advocate for the poor and did all of these things in your church to raise funds to send money to bread for the world? And maybe now at this point, your job is different. It could even be something as powerful as the fact that you yourself have lost a spouse and are grieving yourself and have found healing in your grief process. And that may end up being a gift that you can bless others with. Who knows, my friends? But blessed, blessed. It doesn't only uh, acknowledge the people that are blessed, but it is a challenge to us as people of faith to use that as a list of how we might bless and help others. Amen. Will you join us as we sing together our hymn of the day? Let me see if I can find it here. Fairest Lord Jesus. Please join us as we sing together our hymn of the day, Fairest Lord Jesus.
us now confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Joining our voices with the song of the angels, let us pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of wanderers, you sent the Magi from afar to witness the mystery and majesty of your birth. Send us into the world with your will in our hearts and on our lips. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You created heaven and earth. Through your Spirit, send your encompassing love over the cosmos. Bless the stars that guide our way and the night sky that invites the earth into slumber. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You sent the Magi to follow the star into an uncertain future. May all leaders and people seek your face, especially when paths are not clear, when conflicts rage, tyrants oppress, and fear abounds. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You sent your spirit to dwell with Paul in prison. Send your spirit to those who are imprisoned and enslaved. Give courage and wisdom for building roads that lead to justice and freedom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You bring your healing power to all who seek love, support, and restoration. Dispel fears and shadows. Restore broken relationships and mend broken hearts. Bring relief to those who are sick or struggling. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You sent the Holy Family to seek safety in a new land. Protect all who make similar journeys. Send your guiding spirit to asylum seekers, refugees, and all who journey towards safety. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your glory is shown to the saints. We give thanks for those whose earthly journey has ended and who now dwell with you forever. Give us signs of your continual presence until that day when we arise in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Rejoicing in your word made flesh among us, we commend these prayers to you, confident of your grace and love made known to us in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Open your hearts now to God and receive the blessing. May Christ, who by his incarnation gathered into one things earthly and heavenly, fill you with his joy and peace. And may the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, 
the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you for joining us in worship today. And we hope that this time together was a blessing to you. And we look forward again to being with you in holy worship. Please join us as we sing together our closing hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Please join in singing, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Fall.